Welcome back to it's Let's Tab 59. Hope you're all well. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for your support for the channel so far. It's going quite well. Down to you guys. So, I'm out. It's late afternoon. Uh, really nice day. No wind at all. Fresh, crisp, but not too cold. I'm out on a four mile out and I'm not far now from the house. So I thought I'd just pull over here quickly, start the video. And then we'll tab on at a steady pace. Nice, slow pace, old man's pace. And have a chat about CBRN or as it used to be called, NBC. What is it? So CBRN, for those that you don't know, stands for Chemical, Radio, CB, Chemical Biological, Radiological and Nuclear Warfare. Before it was called NBC, Nuclear, Biological and Chemical. It's got a bigger title now. So I want to talk about that and briefly about the kit and what it's like wearing it. So first of all then, the respirators itself. Well, when I joined up in the 70s and through into the 80s, I think we still had the old what they called S6 respirator. Just a rubber gas mask, canister on the side, two eyepieces, very, very basic, did a job. Two eyepieces, sort of square, rounded off corners, and that was it. And a filter, like I say, on a canister or filter, if you like, screwed on the side. Nasty bit of kit, but it worked. Then, the next generation come along, the S10 respirator. They had a couple of different issues. They had a slightly bigger canister. They upped the canister, I suppose. They tested it, and it could give you more protection for longer or whatever. And yeah, round eyepieces, like I say, so vision was a little bit better. But the best thing about the S10 over the S6 was it had a drinking system. So on the front, it coiled up around the front where you breathed out, where also that was where your radio and your uh, clansman radios would clip on the front so you could talk and matter like a microphone clip. It had a drinking straw. You unpulled it, pulled it off, unwound it. And on the end of that was a male coupling. When you turn the little switch on at the front, there's a little tiny switch, you could feel it with your fingers, you turned that, and across inside your respirator, you'd feel it come across your mouth, you could locate it with your mouth, was the actual drinking straw. The male coupling on the other end of the cord, plugged into the top of your water bottle. Plugged that in, turned your water bottle upside down, and you could drink away, sort of like a, a drip feed. And that was a, a way of getting some fluid in you without taking your respirator off, because when you had the S6, emergency eating and drinking drills, or certainly drinking drills, you have to lift it up and, and try and drink it. Very, very dangerous. So that was a big improvement having that on the S10. And then I think about 11 years ago or so, I was certainly still serving at the time, we had the new GSR, General Service Respirator. Much better setup. It's got the drinking system. It's got a better microphone uh, for radio contact. And big difference on it, it had two canisters, one, it's got two canisters, one either side. It meant that when you had to do a canister change, you could just take one canister off, bin it, put a fresh one on, and then change the other one without the risk of having to hold your breath and any gas getting into your respirator. On the last two, the S6 and the S10, when you've done a canister change, you had to take a deep breath, get your, canister, your new canister ready. You had to hold your breath, shut your eyes, take your old canister off, keep your breath, try and locate the thread, get the new canister on, blow all the crap out of your gas mask, and carry on normal breathing. So with the GSR, that went away which is helpful and i think the gsr although i never fired a rifle with the gsr i believe it's better to shoot with than the old s10 certainly better than the s6 so that's the respirators what else did we have well we had a smock that went over the top a, a, like a hoodie if you like and a pair of trousers and these were charcoal lined and they still are pretty much the same stuff we got now initially back right back in the early days when i got my first one the smock had a separate hood you velcroed the hood on what was that all about uh, then we got newer ones and the hood was integral and so on. And now they've got camouflage ones and everything. But right back in the day, they were just like plain green and grey sort of square patches on them. You've got a pair of inner gloves and outer gloves. The inner gloves are little white cotton gloves that you slipped on to stop your hands sweating. And then you put your rubber protective gloves over the top of that. And you also got a pair of overboots. You still get those gloves and overboots exactly the same today. So that was the kit and you had to hump all that stuff around. The worst bit was wearing it when you had to wear it. So when you went into an NBC phase during your exercise and you got to get your kit on, if it was hot weather, it was rough. I mean, it was hard work, especially your respirators start to get wet inside, the, the inside of the glass eye pieces would steam up and uh, it was really awkward to operate. It didn't matter what trade you had in the army, when you was out in the field and you was a, a phase of the NBC phase of that exercise kicked in, uh, and it could go on for some time, depending on the exercise. It could be just an hour or so, or it could prolong. You could be in that kit for many hours. So 
doesn't matter what job you had, what trade was a mechanic, you know, reamy lad or chef or infantryman or whatever you was in it. Some of the vehicles, some vehicles, especially armoured vehicles, did have pressurisation systems, which supposedly meant that when you was inside that vehicle battened down and you had the system blowing, you didn't have to wear your respirator. I don't know. Some of the old 432s we had had so many holes in them, I don't think that would have worked. But there was a pressurised system. And obviously the Royal Navy guys on board their ships were in a pressurised system. But the rest of us, no, you had to wear your kit. So working or training, let's get down here. Oof. Working or training in an MBC phase on exercise made everything difficult, made your life a lot harder. And of course, especially if you're running, you know, if you're in the infantry, running about doing section attacks, platoon attacks, running around with that kit on, you're really breathing out your ass and sweating a lot. Now, if you're in a chemical environment with that kit on, full respirator, full kit on, noddy kit as we called it, um, obviously you had to have certain drills for emergency actions. For instance, as I spoke about drinking, well with the straw system it's easy, but eating drills, well that's where you used to get, you know, an old AB biscuit, brown biscuit, take a deep breath, hold it, shut your eyes, lift your respirator out of one hand after you decontaminated it and stick your biscuit in your gob and then shut your respirator down, blow out without blowing your biscuit round inside your respirator and, uh, and eat, eat your biscuit. But probably worse than that was taking a dump or having a pee. Emergency defecation and urination drills. You can imagine that. I'm not going to paint that picture for, her, for you. So other bits of kit you've got, well, with your respirator, it came in a, what they call a respirator haversack. It was a big pouch, basically, that clipped onto your webbing, or you could just wear it like a handbag thrown around your neck, depending on your role. In there, obviously, lived your respirator, but also a couple of other items. You'd have your canister fitted, but you'd have a spare canister, certainly in time of war and operations. You'd have a second canister sealed, vacuum sealed, in a, uh, I thought there was a car behind me, then, in a vacuum foil pack. And that was your spare canister if you had to do a canister change. Also, you've got a little puffer bottle of Fuller's Earth, and that was to absorb any chemicals that landed on your suit, etc., or your equipment. And you've got a little block bang rub, they used to call it, but a little Fuller's Earth pad that slipped over your fingers, pad either side, and you could block, bang, and rub the chemical away, supposedly. You also had some detector papers, little sticky post-its, basically. You peeled them out of a little book, one colour and three colour detector papers, Stuck them on your sleeve or your leg. Uh, the one colour detector paper, if chemicals landed on you, the paper would turn blue, little blue spots or whatever, splodges on it. That would tell you you've been hit with an agent. It wouldn't tell you what agent it was, the one colour paper, but it would tell you that an agent had, uh, had landed on you. Three colour detector paper, that narrowed it down. It turned different colours, three different colours, and there was a little chart inside, and it would tell you it was a nerve agent or a blister agent or whatever. So that's a little bit better. You also had atropine. Now you never carried the real thing unless you, I think the guys on Golf War One did carry atropine pens. I didn't do Golf War One. But you had a little training one and it was just an auto jet. So if you were exposed to a nerve agent, you had three of these pens and you could inject them yourself or your mate could inject you with your pens. And that atropine was supposed to be some sort of antidote against a nerve agent. You carried those in there as well. Um, that's pretty much all you had in there, personal kit wise. So that was your CBRN, as they call it now, or NBC kit, personal protective equipment, we'd call it in Sibby Street. So that's what we had, as I say, horrible stuff. Charcoal lined suits. If uh, you've been wearing it a long time, you're sweating, any part of your skin that had been exposed to the inside lining of the jacket, or maybe the trousers. The charcoal lining used to rub off and you had like black marks all over your arms or around your neck or wherever it was. Not very nice at all. And as most veterans would tell you, going into an MBC phase on exercise is probably one of the worst things you could experience, especially if, like I say, if it was a prolonged period. So, I hope that's brought back a few memories for some of you, maybe. Um, MBC days. What do you remember? Do you remember getting in your... I remember getting in your green maggot in your DOS bag and having to sleep. I remember once I think we were in full kit in our DOS bags with respirators on 
and I took mine off and put it on the back of my head so I could breathe a bit better. <laughs> Laid on my front with my respirator on the back of my head, but I got caught. Obviously, when you were testing this kit, certainly in basic training, and also once a year when you've done your regular yearly testing, one of your military tests, was an NBC test, or CBRN test. And certainly in basic training, um, you'd go into um, a chamber. We call it a gas chamber. It was just a, a block, brick block building maybe. And you went in there and the instructor, whoever's taking you, would, um, would light some little tablets of CS gas, get the gas going around the chamber, and then you'd all go in there. Uh, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, actual real footage of it. And the recruits, or the training soldiers that had been trained, would uh, have to carry out certain drills, maybe drinking drills, decontaminating each other, a canister change, whatever. And then at the end, they would take you up to the door, line you up, and the instructor would ask each person in turn to remove his or her respirator, say the name, rank number, and then walk out the door. And that's where you see people piling in. It's really comical. I know you've got some good stories about that, you lads out there. So, oh, here we are. We're back at the house. So, thanks for tuning in. Drop us a few comments about NBC, you guys out there. Robert, I know you'll come up with some at your lunatic. Right, give us a shout. Remember, subscribe if you can. If you haven't, please consider it. And uh, until the next time, troops. Let's tap.